Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Minerva Inwald. I'm the Seminars Officer for the Australian Society for Asian Humanities. Um, I'm also a, post, a Judith Nielsen Postdoctoral Fellow in Contemporary Art at the University of New South Wales. Uh, before we start today, I would like to acknowledge um, the traditional custodians of the land on which I am on, which is the Wangal people of the Eora Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Um, and also like to uh, pay my respects to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people here with us today. Um, so the event that we have today is co-presented by the Department of Chinese Studies, uh, the Sydney Southeast Asia Centre and the, uh, at the University of Sydney, um, as well as the Australian Society for Asian Humanities um, and the Faculty of Art, Design and Architecture at UNSW. So to um, introduce our speaker today, I'm gonna to hand over to uh, Josh Stenberg from the uh, Department of Chinese Studies at the University of Sydney. Thank you. Thanks Minerva. And I'd like to thank also Yanping Zhang for uh, making the tech side of this event possible. Um, it's a really great pleasure to uh, introduce Bei Yu Zhang, who is now affiliated with the School of International Studies Academy of Overseas Chinese Studies at Jinan University in Guangzhou. She obtained her PhD degree in the history department from the National University of Singapore. And we were just discussing um, how, uh, you know, we've missed all the conferences where we ought to have seen one another. She and I are very much in the same field. I should say I'm Josh Denberg, Department of Chinese Studies um, at the University of Sydney. Um, and it's really for me personally, if I can be selfish for a moment, it's very exciting to see Bayou's work. Uh, come out her recent uh, book, Chinese Theater Troops in Southeast Asia Touring Diaspora 1900s to 1970s, as well as articles in Asian Theater Journal. I'm really looking forward also to her um, article upcoming in Asian Ethnology. So exciting for those of us interested in the history of circulations of culture um, among and beyond Chinese communities in Southeast Asia um, to have such an exciting uh, young scholar presenting uh, a really strong um, series of publications. So it's a really great honor and pleasure uh, to introduce her. The format of this presentation presentation will be um, so that, you know, the whole event will take about an hour. And I think Bayou will leave some time for questions uh, at the end. Um, you may put your questions either in the Q&A um, or the chat, and I will try to keep up. So without further ado, uh, may I ask uh, Bayou to begin her presentation? Okay, um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Mavana and Josh and Yanping for uh, organizing this panel and uh, inviting me to this um, uh, to 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 give this talk. Um, so uh, I think I'll share my screen first, and then I can talk. Uh, wait a minute. Um, yeah. So can. It works, right? Good. Uh, so um, uh, I'm very grateful for uh, University of Sydney and China Study Center for giving me this opportunity to talk about my book, which is here and um, uh, the actual book because it's very expensive and uh, many uh, school libraries have, have not yet bought it. So, um, but the ebook is available, which is much cheaper. So if you are interested, in, please do ask your library to buy it. Um, uh, it uh, this is my first book talk. So it's very important for me um, to, to hear the feedback from the audience and also to hear the opinions about how you think about it and what further direction it can be pushed. So I really appreciate it uh, in the, in the, after my talk, you could, give me more uh, ideas and um, uh, interactions about the, the book. Yeah, so uh, now I'd like to start. Um, the, talk, the title of the talk is Traveling with Chinese Theater Troops in Southeast Asia, but I also adjust the title a little bit to uh, focus more exactly, um, more concrete on the idea of mobility, locality, and the performativity of Chinese-ness. So these three key words, these three key phrases were basically uh, in my conclusion that after I writing uh, the whole story, I realized that these are the three um, key terms I, I wish to, um, to, to, uh, to articulate. 
uh, with the, 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 the theater troops. Um, so yeah, um, so overall I have uh, been, uh, the overall time scale of the book is divided into uh, two big parts. Uh, in the first part, I include four chapters um, to examine the itinerant theater troops on the Sino Southeast Asian corridor during the period of 1900s to 1930s. And in part two, I um, uh, the part two starts with the funding of PRC in 1949. So it enters the Cold War. So I titled it, uh, dangerous reaching out via performative linkages in the Cold War. Um, okay, so uh, here is a brief background knowledge about the project. The story um, that I wrote was inspired by an oral history uh, of a Singaporean Chinese performer called Bai Yan. Uh, he was this old, old man in the photo. So he was born in Hunan province in 1920, in 1920 in China. Then he traveled to Southeast Asia at the age of 18 with a theater company from Shanghai. And so it was about 1938. So from then on, he had led an itinerant performing life in uh, Southeast Asia since then. Um, his first diasporic stage show was in Bangkok and after which his theater company further traveled to Kalanta in the northern part of Malaya and continued the performing tours all the way southward to Singapore. So uh, sitting next to him is his wife, Ye Qing. Uh, Ye, uh, when uh, Ye Qing was another uh, a troupe member, I was, was also a, a performing artist uh, who traveled from another theater company coming from Shanghai. So the two, uh, Two, uh, two young people met each other in Singapore and they get married and they stayed here for the rest of their life. And uh, they both of them had been living, leading a itinerant performing career in Southeast Asia. And they all become very famous uh, kind of performers across the, 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 the Malaya and the Singapore. And people all know the names of Bai Yan and Ye Qing. So, um, Bai Yan's story was not singular in the theater history of Chinese diaspora in Southeast Asia. Since the early 20th century, I find that there are numerous Chinese theater troops left the hometowns in China, not just uh, along the south southern coast, like what we said, uh, uh, Nanfang. Uh, there are also troops coming from Shanghai and Wuhan, uh, those more um, uh, those uh, eastern along the eastern coastline, and some if some of the troops even came from the interland, the, the inner land, like Wuhan, um, uh, uh, these places. These troops, uh, so the places, the origin of these troops were not examined in a very um, serious manner. Um, so um, these troops left uh, their native hometowns in China and conducted itinerant tours to major Southeast Asian port cities that included Singapore, Penang, uh, Bangkok, and Java, and many others. But also by making use of the improved transportation networks, these, these troops were able to travel further to the hinterland and the countryside, including like um, Johor Bahru and the other eastern part of Mal Malaysia. They conducted a great variety of shows that included dialect theater, um, like the Chaozhou Theater that I talked about in my book, and more also uh, modern dramas, musicals, and songs and dances. So um, I was very interested in these personal stories and I began to think about if there is a larger picture that could incorporate all these episodes into a coherent narrative so, so that I could evaluate the role of performing arts in the history of Chinese diaspora and in the in the, in the way the diaspora was engaged with, with China. Um, so um, I began to formulate these sets of questions. What were the purposes and the motivations of their diasporic tours in the first place? What places in China did these theater troops came from and what sorts of linkages were formed in the process? What were the ideas and the theatrical practice that had been circulated across the territorial boundaries? And how the different kinds of performative discourses helped to shape the understanding of Chineseness in different historical times across the diaspora. 
These questions lead me to identify the significance of these four sets of troops that all left uh, plenty of historical materials and visual legacies for me to write about the story. So uh, here I have um, uh, zoomed into four sets of troops. Um, uh, each of them were very distinct in performing styles, but also they were nurtured in their own unique time space constructions. So they include the Chaozhou theater troops that traveled from native place Shantou to the Chinese diaspora in Bangkok. And there are also three um, varied forms uh, under this Chaozhou theater. Uh, they evolved in changing contexts. For example, the first one were the actual troops, the traveling entities that make constant uh, tours uh, across the South China seas. And then the second one is a tour. Um, why I put it as a tour? Because uh, after 1949, the, the funding of PRC and the, 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 the entering of Cold War politics, the movement of this actual entity, the troops were very difficult. It was no longer possible to have the troops from China to come to Southeast Asia to perform. So what the so what what the troops so what what uh, what emerged at the time was uh, uh, a, a cultural and diplomatic tour in Hong Kong, the only window that the Chinese the, the mainland China had at the time. So through Hong Kong, it further reached out to the Southeast Asian Chinese. So the second form, the tour, is a cultural diplomatic initiation. Uh, after the founding of PRC and uh, it, the, the, the Chaozhou Theater it, it performed was also a reformed socialist, um, uh, a, a, a reformed socialist Chaozhou Theater. So um, it signaled a limited mobility as circumscribed by geopolitics of Cold War. The third version was uh, opera, Chaozhou opera films made by Hong Kong companies and circulated by Southeast Asian transnational entrepreneurs. So the, this third kind of um, Chaozhou opera film was, a, was more like a cultural, a transportable cultural commodity that leveled up the degree of mobility even in very difficult times. So in all these different forms, the Chaozhou theater channeled a dialect-based communal Chineseness rooted in a romanticized imagination of their native place. The second set is China's song and dance troupe from Shanghai and its encounters with the overseas Chinese in Singapore from 1928 to 1929. And the third set is um, national salvation troops born in during World War II um, when China was uh, fighting the war against the Japanese invasion. So it had a strong patriotic uh, overtone and it, it was mostly leftist. Um, uh, it toured uh, British Malaya from 1937 to 1940. The, um, the last set of troops was the, uh, was the um, Hong Kong movie star at troop. Um, so uh, in, this, uh, in this case, I presented that um, uh, independent nation states like Singapore and Malaysia appropriated the performed Chinese-ness in this troupe to make its own citizens, especially the, their ethnic Chinese, to identify with the ideology of multiculturalism. And on the, on the other hand, to reframe the embodied Chinese-ness within their own political agenda or to facilitate the diplomatic interactions with China. Um, yeah, so... Uh, these are a brief introduction about the four sets of troops. Um, Marshall Salins uh, in 1985 used the term performative encounters as a way to balance the analysis of theatrical circulations, exchanges, contact, and on the other hand, a close reading of theatrical performance. So the travelings and the tours of these theater troops would allow me to map different transnational networks and connections as part of these theatrical circulations proposed by Salins. And in the meanwhile, the divergent local receptions and the responses from the diaspora urged me to weave a cultural analysis in terms of uh, what kinds of theatrical strategies were used, what, what were the um, uh, aesthetic adjustment adaptations and innovations that were made in the performance. So it both 
attend to the idea of circulation and also uh, the idea of uh, close reading of theatrical performance. So uh, here uh, I made a new, I made a map. I did a lot on this map um, to basically uh, give the audience an, a more visual and a straightforward idea about how the troops travel. So um, charting the roots of their diasporic tours unveil a complex web of travel and relationship through which you will see that multi-directional rays spread all over the map and crisscrossed each others. So along these colorful lines, we would, we would get a sense of how these uh, flows and the fluxes of people, ideas and practices were going on back then. So um, the blue star uh, represent the Chaozhou Theater. It first came from Shantou, it set off from Shantou and by taking the uh, first route across the South China Sea, uh, this was before 1949 uh, when the movement was, was allowed. So they first traveled to Bangkok. Uh, Bangkok had the largest total of immigrants living there. So Bangkok become, also became a regional hub in uh, transshipping the Chaozhou Theater to other parts of the hinterlands. For example, the Chaozhou Theater troops could uh, take a Northern railway as, as, as far as Chiang Mai and also a Southern railway to cross the borders uh, of um, uh, southern borders and then goes to the northern part of uh, Malaya, like Georgetown, Penang, Ipoh, and all the way to Singapore. It can also uh, uh, took a railway and uh, uh, cross the border to Phnom Penh. So this is before 1949, before the Cold War. And the second route I, I highlighted here is this is Hong Kong. So uh, during during the socialist reform area, the Chaozhou, the, the Chaozhou Theater was reformed into a, a socialist style. So it represented the socialist culture. Then the government thought it would it was time to use these native place native place connections to reach out to the overseas Chinese, but only through Hong Kong. So it conducted a tour in Hong Kong in 1960. And after the tour, the performance, the, the performance was extremely well received by the local Hong Kong Chinese. People were all swarmed into the theater to, to watch the show. So um, back then, the, the, it, it, um, it gives um, opens, mark, opens a niche market uh, for those Hong Kong film companies and they realized it, there's a great potential to make this Chaozhou opera into films and uh, to, to fit, uh, to, to, to cater for the Southeast Asian market, especially there are large number of Teochew Chinese who longed for this um, performing art from the homeland. So the Hong Kong companies began to make film, uh, opera films and circulate them into Bangkok, Singapore, and Malaysia. This is the story of Chaozhou theater. And also the red, the orange circle represents China's song and dance troupe uh, from 1928. It set off from Shanghai and uh, it for, uh, after that it came to Hong Kong as a departing port. From Hong Kong, it goes to Singapore and then from after performing in Singapore, it go, go, continued to Bangkok and finishing its performance in Bangkok, it continued all the way south to uh, to tour across the um, uh, northern um, western part of Malaya, Malay Archipelago, and then uh, it it went as far as in Dutch Indies like Bandung, Batavia, Java, Samaran, um, Surabaya, and it, the troop got disbanded in uh, Java. The troop leader Li Jinghui actually returned to Singapore for one and a half year and the surgeon there, uh, they, he got bankrupt. So, ha so he has to write those love songs to make money so that he could actually return to China. And uh, for the national salvation troops, it is represented in a uh, red triangle uh, setting off from Wuhan, which is in an inner uh, place inner center of China, of mainland China. And then it came to Hong Kong as also as a departing port. From Hong Kong, it traveled to Singapore and toured across British Malaya, like both the West uh, and the Eastern part. 
the Hong Kong, the 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 last the uh this in the the uh heart in black color represent Hong Kong movie star as true. So this one is quite direct because it's uh it's it's directly uh interacted with the Singapore government and the Malaysian government. So it only came to two places. Um so the key question is how to make sense of these complex and multi-directional linkages, those multiple node points. Um, it, it is not likely to write a story that include every locality in great details and every linkages in, uh, in great details. So I have to be selective in my case studies. Um, I argue that uh, there are multiple time-space constructions in which these homeland diaspora interactions actually took place and gained meaning. So um, here are a set of literature that I read. I was firstly inspired by Shelley Chen's temporality. So uh, she was arguing that diaspora is less a collection of communities than a series of moments in which reconnection with the homeland take place. So to think diaspora temporally, she divides the time scale into diaspora time and diaspora moments. Diaspora time refers to the on diverse ongoing ways in which migration affects the community. It was more like what I have been talking about in the Chaozhou theater, that the communal identity making is a long process and it's a continued process even today, even till today. So, um, there are also diaspora moments that erupts and recurs when diaspora time interacts with other temporalities and produces unexpectedly wide reverberations, such as the World War II and the Cold War. And these moments had great impacts on the way the people perform their Chinese-ness. The question of why certain theater troops initiated tours at a particular point of time invites me to see, first of all, momentous events taking place in the homeland or the diaspora as a result of their engagement with the world. So situated temporarily, each theater troupe represented the means by which two sides, the homeland diaspora, were reconnected to articulate changing meanings of being Chinese in the world. And, um, I was also uh, inspired by the idea of spatiality, like how uh, Sulin Lewis deals with her study in, 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 in researching the connections of Southeast Asian cities. So he, she has coined the term web of three cities by looking at specific localities of Penang, Bangkok, and Bur Burma. And Carolyn Chai also used the idea of archipelago imagination to talk about specific uh, places that connect, that that form, the, that uh, link together and uh, circulating the Hokkien opera. Like for example, she talks about Taiwan, Singapore, Jinmen, and Southern Fujian. So I think the, uh, th these are very uh, useful concepts for me to, 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 um, to engage with. Um, the wrestling of two polling centers in my study are not fixed and predetermined and need, to, and need to be examined in disparate spatial temporal configurations. So spatially speaking, diaspora and China will need to be more concrete, for instance, by pointing out specific localities among which different linkages and connections were formed, persisted and challenged. So the act of performing Chinese-ness in certain ways was as much time bound as it was place specific. For example, um, I've talked about Chaozhou Theater here, right? Uh, so I have to, uh, to, to, context, to contextualize the place of Shantou and which was uh, perpetuated as a romanticized static origin rooted in specific ancestral homeland. And on the receiving side, I have been looking at the closely knitted Kyochu diaspora centered in the Bangkok. And also um, in looking at China song and dance too, it traveled to many places, but I only look at the, the connection formed from Shanghai and Singapore, from Shanghai to Singapore. Especially if you look at the performance, you will see that the troupe performed the multi-layered ideas of Chinese-ness which was to be defined by a syncretic mixture of nationalism and cosmopolitanism. And this was born and nurtured in the unique 
space, time space of Shanghai around the late 1920s. And for the national salvation troops, Wuhan became a, a political, economic, and military center during World War II. A majority of left-wing cultural workers gathered to conduct national salvation movement for the motherland. The fact that all the salvation troops were sent from Wuhan reaffirmed the importance of this place in performing Chinese in certain ways. And in the post-colonial context, the place of Hong Kong added new dynamics in the homeland diaspora interactions. So through Hong Kong, socialist opera and the theater were repackaged through their commercial strategies. And in the Cold War confrontations, Hong Kong also acted as a mediating context zone, opening itself to both the left and the right cultural influences. So, um, so um, through the lens of theater troops, I um, so this um, um, so uh, so by far I have laid out the analytical framework of the study. Uh, so these are the underlying logics that make my four case studies come together as a coherent unit. So in the following talk, I'm going to present some more visual materials to give you some idea about the performed Chinese-ness and how they varied and changed in different times and spaces. So the first one is Chaozhou Theater in circulation. I basically arranged them in a chronological order from left hand to the right hand. So the figure one is um, earliest form of Chaozhou theater performed in a street, usually in front of a temple with a temporary shelter. So it functioned as a ritual place for the communal gathering. And this communal and religious function continued today. If you go to Bangkok, Chinatown and Penang and Singapore, uh, the Hungry Ghost Festival, you would still see the kind of dialect theater performing for their ritual, for their ritual occasions. So channeled by dialect, Chaozhou theater troops helped to sustain the diasporic Chinese-ness by continually performing the native place affinity to keep the diaspora in a meaningful relationship with its past. The figure two uh, features a scene. Uh, this is this, the, the second picture is taken on uh, performing of Chaozhou theater around 1930s. So it, it, it is performing a uh, new stage tricks by using fire in the performance. Um, so when Chaozhou, this was around 1920s and 1930s when Chaozhou theater practitioners adopted new practices from Shanghai. So uh, in addition to the old native place connections that underwrote a communal identity, I argue that diaspora Chinese also search for the modern and cosmopolitan part of their Chinese-ness from the Noda point of Shanghai. But um, this was made possible by the frequent traveling of mobile individuals and the innovators who had experience in the Shanghai theater stage. But there are also many instances whereby these ideas from Shanghai were not applicable when encountered diasporic conditions. For example, in, in employing stage innovations, uh, there was one a technician from Shanghai named Lin Jingtai. Uh, he tried to install electricity on the stage in the in the theater of Bangkok to lighten the 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 the, the background. Uh, then it turns out that the power went down for three times during the performance, so the whole stage was in blackout, and the audience all spec all get bored, and they want to uh, they want a return a refund of their ticket. There are also other issues like the language problem. A Teochew dialect speaker could hardly uh, communicate with the imported Shanghai stage technicians. So um, lacking space and equipment, these complicated stage uh, innovations in the end turn out to be a luxury for the theater in the Chinese diaspora like Bangkok. Um, and uh, but also into the 19, into the 1930s, Nanyang and the Southeast Asian diaspora attracted China's domestic audience uh, as a place of mobility and diversity and openness. There was a unique Nanyang ecology that nurtured distinct theatrical practice by using certain musical instruments that were only available in Southeast Asia, which is coconut. So when the theater troupe used coconut to play the music and they travel back to Shanghai and Shantou, 
audience were all surprised and they really enjoyed the, the, the performance. So they also, the Nanyang uh, Theater Troupe brought about this newness and excitement for the professional theater reviewers in Shanghai. Um, Photo 3 features a new type of theatricality, like this one in red color, Ru Yan Ying Chun. So this theatricality appeared in Chaozhou Theater after 1949 in the native hometown Shantou. It was the adoption of socialist aestheticism as part of the nationwide socialist reconstruction from 1949 to 1960. So this photo shows a documentary film about China's new socialist education in the opera school. To install a modern education institution under which operatic knowledge would be standardized um, into professional, professional training courses. So as a result of this socialist education, opera performers were turned into uh, educated socialist culture workers. So the image showed that the image in these three pictures or showed that the old xizi, which was a derogative term for actors, were now transformed into respectful cultural workers. They received good education and were healthy and cheerful, both physically and mentally. This was what was uh, written in a party's report. So it was the communists and the socialist opera reform that saved the Chaozhou theater. Uh, from and the theater actors from abusive master apprentice system. This was an old training system by, by like masters and apprentices. It also highlights a socialist modernity by infusing the Stanislavski system from Soviet Union. Like the last picture on the right hand showcased that. So they, they, they installed this uh, realistic acting style from Soviet Union to reform the old theatricality. There were, so by doing so, the, the, the socialist reform want to convey the message to the Hong Kong and Southeast Asian audience that there was a distinction to be made with the old society and the Western cultures. By doing so, the party state could um, claim itself as a savior of authentic cultural heritage when it tried to reach out to the diaspora. So here, the old native place ties were invoked through the Chaozhou theater, and they were endowed with new and significant political meanings in the PRC's diplomatic interactions with Southeast Asian countries. All these ideologies and the cultural discourses were embodied in this Hong Kong tour. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so the last picture is also very interesting. We go back to this slide. Uh, it's called Su Liu Niang. So it features a Chaozhou opera film made by Hong Kong film companies and screened by Southeast Asian transnational entrepreneurs. Due to the ideological struggles between the Kuomintang and the uh, pro Kuomintang side and pro Beijing side, both in Hong Kong and Southeast Asia, the film market was also divided into two uh, camps, the, le the left wing section and the right wing section. But nevertheless, despite these uh, top-down texts, they all produced the Chaozhou opera films and they seek collaborations either with the mainland troops, this was done mostly by the left-wing film companies. They collaborated with mainland troops and for the others, the right wing, the pro Guomindang sections, they would look for other sources, mostly from the Bangkok Chaozhou theater. So there was a, uh, there was a thriving of these cooperations between Bangkok Chaozhou Theater and businessmen with the Hong Kong troops and the film companies. So um, this is why I put here, there is one film and three versions. Uh, the first version is shot by the Hong, Tu, uh, Hong Kong's Hong Tu Film Company. This is a left wing and it received fun fundings from Zhou Enlai and from the Beijing government. So it's definitely a left wing company. So it made, it collaborated with this mainland troop that toured in Hong Kong in 1960. So after the tour, it contacted the troop and then they co-produced a Chaozhou opera film called Su Liu Niang. And soon after this film, uh, the audience were all crazy about this Liu Niang. Everyone was talking about the idea of Liu Niang, their performance, they are so beautiful. So the, the other uh, film and 
enter enterprises like Dongshan, this is a right wing, it's a pre pro Kuomintang faction, also made a Sulionian version by inviting actors and actresses from Thailand, Bangkok. And there is also a Thailand production of Sulionian that was made in Thailand and screened in Thailand. So um, you see, we will see that in the Cold War era, when connection was interrupted by geopolitics, Chaozhou dialect theater practitioners developed new routes of traveling and transgressing the ideological divide of left and the right. So the more important argument to make is that this new Chaozhou theater as circulated by the Hong Kong filmmakers was a hybrid creation. It drew influences from the socialist theater reform that basically redefined the artistic standards. And also many Hong Kong right wing theater practitioners um, uh, imported the uh, film actresses from Thailand and also stage musicians, actors. Uh, they cross fertilized their artistic skills and the performing styles and uh, re repackaging the performance with commercial strategies and be, then screen them to Southeast Asia. And uh, some of the right wing performer, the so-called right wing, they also um, they 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 retold in their oral history that they also, uh, in actual practice, they constantly watch the performance of those mainland troops to um, to try to refine and their artistic standards to learn from those uh, mainland troops so that the their own performing skill could be developed into a better way. Um, so, um, so I argue here that the socialist theater, um, Chaozhou theater circulates through Hong Kong needs to be understood as a hybrid integration of diasporic heritage, commercial oriented statums and socialist aesthetics. So uh, here by far, here is a discussion about the changes and the continuities in the Chaozhou theater to unpack the ways in which theater troops enact their agency to circumvent ideological confrontations. And in the process, they constantly altered, adjusted and created new artistic expressions in performing Chinese in the diaspora. And there are other sets of troops, which I would go over uh, a bit quickly uh, here. The um, China song and dance troupe born from Shanghai uh, it was born from the moment of, uh, of um, when China was marching on a national awakening. So it calls for the ideas of using national language uh, through children's songs and dances. So figure one is a group photo of those performing girls from Shanghai in the troupe. So they represented a modern and enlightened idea of Chineseness that would speak to China's national, national awakening and identity making. And the second picture was about a performance in which girls dressed in the butterfly costumes enacted a fairy tale stories about three butterfly friendship. So the performance imitated the Western musicals while also presenting the music. Um, in presenting the music, it drew inspirations from Chinese folk melodies and operatic stories. The figure three is a Nanyang uh, school that tried to imitate the performance of China's song and dance troupe and staged their local version. And this one uh, uh, is a national salvation movement performance during in the street. So this was a very famous oil paint by the artist Xu Bei Hong in 1939 during his surgery in Singapore. So when he was uh, uh, a refugee of the war and a surgeon in Singapore, he met this actress of Wang Yun, uh, the, actress, the actress Wang Ying. Uh, she was uh, a member of the Salvation Troop, New China Troop. Uh, she was conducting this uh, street theater performance called, uh, called Put Down Your Whip, Fang Xia Ni Da Bianzi, to, to criticize the Japanese um, atrocity in mainland China and asking the audience to make donations to the warfare. So he, so he was able to capture the scene and draw the picture, draw the portrait of the performance. Um, the last one is a Hong Kong movie star as true. Uh, so in the Cold War, the theater troops from Hong Kong replaced those of 
from Shantou um, to, to represent the Chinese culture in the diaspora. Uh, so this was a left-wing company because most of the actors come from left-wing uh, circles and uh, they had connections with the mainland. Um, the, they were selected at this particular time and year um, uh, when Singapore and Malaysia marched to independence and national development. So different from the earlier cases whereby the tours were all enacted by the homeland, the diasporic tour of this troop was initiated by local Singapore and the Malaysian government to fit into the priorities of their nation building. The troop articulated the meaning of Chinese-ness, one that was hardworking, disciplined and the professional cultural workers, not the movie stars that uh, as in contrast to the yellow culture and capitalist culture, bred in the colonial era Singapore. And it is also widely criticized by the Singapore government in their anti-colonial struggles, the yellow culture. So the performances highlighted ethnic diversity, harmony, and uh, try to speak to the racial problems in the post-colonial Singapore. In these critical encounters, the left-wing troops employed subtle strategies to articulate the image of socialist China on one hand, and the local governments also reframed the embodied Chinese-ness within their own political agenda or to facilitate the diplomatic interactions with China, like what Malaysian government did in 1971. So um, here are some thoughts. I think um, in studying this performing arts and a literary area, um, one cannot avoid the Sinophone scholarship that looks that asks scholars to pay attention to the heterogeneity of the expression of Chinese-ness, which is um, very much true. But I also uh, agree with Chen and some other scholars pointing out that Chinophone scholarship has rendered a center periphery uh, binary by, by, by saying that um, um, the, there is a, a force that making the uh, diaspora receptive to the homeland influence and we need to break that influence. But I think it is not necessary because um, but, uh, because the Chinese-ness in the supposed center is also fragmentary. It's not uh, a coherent idea of Chinese-ness. It constantly changed across historical times and in different spaces like I have laid out. So we have to be more specific about what ideas of Chinese-ness were you talking about. There was also the issue of agency, like in understanding these like um, various media form like literature and uh, arts and uh, um, troops, they used to be seen as a mirror of social change. But I argue that uh, in doing so, they ignore the idea how, how the theater practitioners had their agency. So they became a role player in the homeland diaspora interactions. And also there are these dynamics of homeland diaspora interactions. Is this, all, is this always the case that the homeland um, court and the diaspora response? I argue that we need to be more careful because as the theater troupe case I presented here uh, uh, um, illustrate that there are moments that are particular uh, important for the diaspora society for the host countries. So um, the impact response were not always a one way directional. Sometimes the diaspora could also um, reappropriate the performed Chinese-ness from China for their own political agenda. Yeah, so thank you very much. That's all for my 